Good day. This is Norma Duncan. Thank you for joining us in our lesson entitled, Why Should Every Christian Pray For and Support Israel? This teaching that you will hear today was presented for the first time in the month of May 1982 at the Living Word Church. Since then, this tape lesson has been played throughout the world, imparting spiritual knowledge to both Jews and Gentiles alike. We will be teaching from the Amplified Translation of God's Holy Word, unless otherwise specified. By doing this, we'll save time and long explanations of many Greek and Hebrew words. Let's pray. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, I ask that you will touch the hearts of the thousands and maybe millions of people who will eventually hear this tape lesson. Open our spiritual eyes so that we may see your divine plan for the nation of Israel and your people, the Jews. Put within the Gentile Christians a desire to see your will done in Israel. You, O oh Lord, have provided these tape lessons of your holy word for all people who will listen to them. You've made them available free of charge and postpaid to the rich and poor alike so all men will have an opportunity to learn and obey your word, so all men will come to realize why we Christians must pray for and support Israel. Use this vessel, your servant, O Lord, to speak out your word fearlessly to all the world, and give those who hear this your word the wisdom they need to understand it and the desire to obey it. I ask this for your name's sake, O Lord. And may you receive all the glory. In the name of Jesus, amen. All over the world, God is calling Christians to pray for Israel. Some years ago, God began to deal with our body of believers at the Living Word Church about this very thing. We knew that God had called us to send his word by tape throughout the world. We knew we were called to send it free of charge and postpaid, but then the Lord began to deal with us again, and this time God called us to intercede in prayer for Israel. At this time, we had recently finished a series of teachings on prayer. During this series, we saw that God's word instructed that we pray for Jerusalem. In blind faith, we obeyed God's word. We obeyed without even understanding why God required that we pray in this manner. God's word said, do it, so we did it. Then as people began to inquire as to why we felt we should pray for Israel every time the doors of the church opened, and why we supported Israel so vigorously, we could only give them the same answers that everyone else gave. We would say, because they are God's chosen people, or because God loves them, or they're special to God, or because God said he would bless those who bless them. But we could not tell them why they were God's chosen people. We could never tell them why God loves them or why God continues to love them throughout the ages. We were not able to explain why they are special to God. And we did not know why God blessed people who blessed them. We would just say, it's a fact. God says so in his word and we believe his word. We had no idea why we should pray for Israel outside of the fact that God said we should, and that was enough for us, so we did. Then in May 1982, God opened our understanding to the greatest, most important reason why he has called his church to intercession for Israel. God showed us so that we could in turn send this marvelous information to you by means of these free tapes that God is making available to all the world. One of the most important truths in this lesson, though you will learn many, will be this. Your prayer and support for Israel and the Jews must not depend on feelings alone, for you might not feel compassionate every day. Neither must your support for Israel depend on decisions that the Israeli government might make each day. Because you will not always agree with their decisions or policies. For instance, 
world opinion was split over Israel's decision to invade Lebanon. Then there was the world uproar over the PLO massacre, after which many false accusations against Israel were made. So as you can see, not everyone in the world is in agreement with certain actions of the Israeli government, or in some cases, their failure to act. If your prayer and support for Israel hangs on whether or not they react to situations as you think they should, then I'm afraid your support will not endure the test. You see, the day may come when you are so upset with an action they may have taken or a judgment they may have made which conflicts with your own ideas of how things should be handled that you will change your mind and stop supporting them saying, This is wrong! God would not want me to side with Israel in this matter. You might become disillusioned. And then you might even feel that they should be punished for what you think is their lack of discretion. And because you might have had a bad day yourself, you may feel that their punishment should be severe. Making your judgments on how you feel or what you think instead of basing your decision and drawing your conclusion from God's word alone. You might even go so far as to want your own government to stop any aid or support earmarked for Israel. Then what will happen? You'll play right into the hands of Israel's enemies. And again, if you support Israel for personal gain alone, trying to benefit by the promises God made in his word, when God said, I will bless those who bless Israel and curse those who curse it, the day may come in the future when your desire to see him punished might be greater than your desire for personal gain. Or you might convince yourself that since they are doing something you consider to be wrong or even evil, the curse might not apply in that particular situation. Because in your estimation, they deserve to be punished. However, when you have finished listening to this entire tape lesson, you will have learned from God's word that if you are a true follower of God, Christian, your support for Israel will no longer be conditional. Your support for Israel will not depend on your personal likes or dislikes or any personal convictions you might have. Your support for Israel will not even depend on whether you like the Jewish people or not, but rather on whether you love and know God and want to see His will done throughout the world and especially in Israel. Why especially in Israel? Because as we will see in a little while, Israel is special to God. Jesus said, if you love him, you will obey his word. And that means in regard to Israel also. John fourteen twenty three through 24, Jesus answered, If a person loves me, he will keep my word. Obey my teachings and my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home, abode, special dwelling place with him. Anyone who does not really love me does not observe and obey my teaching. And the teaching which you hear and heed is not mine, but comes from the Father who sent me. We are also told that those who know God keep his commandments. And those who say they know him, but do not obey his commands are liars. First John 2, 3 through 5. And this is how we may discern daily by experience that we are coming to know him, to perceive, recognize, understand, and become better acquainted with him. If we keep, bear in mind, observe, practice his teachings, precepts, commandments. Whoever says, I know him, I perceive, recognize, understand, I'm acquainted with him, but fails to keep and obey his commandments, teachings is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But he who keeps his word, who bears in mind his precepts, who observes his message in its entirety, truly in him has the love of and for God been perfected, completed, reached maturity. By this we may perceive and know and recognize and be sure that we are in him. Every word Jesus spoke was from God. The commands he gave were God's commands. So when he said in John fifteen fourteen, You are my friends if you keep on doing the things which I command you to do. These commands were God's commands. So today, 
We will see if you are truly Jesus' friend. We'll also see if you love God. And we'll see if you even know God. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. You'll find those words in John 1 and 1. Jesus is the Word. The Word of all the Scriptures, not just the Gospel, the New Testament. Paul tells us that all the Scriptures are inspired by God. When Paul said these words, the Old Testament Scriptures were the only Scriptures available to men. The Bible, as we Christians know it, was not put together until approximately 300 years after Christ's death. Keeping this in mind, let's look in 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. Verse 16. Every scripture is God-breathed, given by His inspiration, and profitable for instruction for reproof and conviction of sin, for correction of error and discipline in obedience, and for training in righteousness, that is, in holy living, in conformity to God's will, in thought, purpose, and action, so that the man of God may be complete and proficient, well fitted and thoroughly equipped for every good work. So the Old Testament scriptures are for the purpose of showing you what is right in God's sight. So that you, Christian, can fully walk in God's commands. Knowing this, let's look in Psalms 122 verses 1 through 9. Here we see God's righteous instructions on praying for Israel. Verse 1, David, inspired by God, says, I was glad... When they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem, which is built as a city that is compact together, to which the tribes go up, even the tribes of the Lord, as was decreed and as a testimony for Israel to give thanks to the name of the Lord. For there thrones of judgment were set, the thrones of the house of David. Now listen to verse 6. Look at it in your Bibles and read the instructions of the Lord. Verse 6. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper that love you, the holy city. In verse 7, David even shows you how to pray. He prays, peace be within your walls and prosperity within your palaces. He goes on to say in verse 8, For my brethren and companions' sake, I will now say, Peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek, inquire for, and require your good. God commands, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. As we begin our lesson, let's first allow God's word to answer for us some of the many questions that men have longed to understand throughout the generations. Both Jews and Gentiles have been trying to figure out why God chose the Jews as his own people. Why didn't God choose one of the other nations who were far more powerful and attractive at that time? They were the Jews, mere slaves in Egypt. So why in the world did God choose this unattractive group of people who were to give him nothing but trouble from the day he brought them out of Egypt? Why them? Why the Jew? The truth is the Jews were God's chosen people even before he delivered them from Egypt. The reason they are a chosen nation is not because they were different or special in any way. And God's choice certainly had nothing to do with Israel being a righteous nation because as you know by what took place during their 40 years in the wilderness, they were an unrighteous, hard-headed, grumbling, and complaining bunch of people who grieved God for the whole 40 years they had spent in the wilderness. Look in Psalms 95, verse 10. This is the Lord speaking in this verse. Verse 10. Forty years long was I grieved and disgusted with that generation and said it is a people who do err in their hearts and they do not approve, acknowledge, or regard my ways. These people had grieved God with their sin. They were neither righteous nor special. 
But you see, the Jews themselves were not the reason God chose them as a nation. The Jews had nothing to do with God's choice. Instead, it was because of Abraham, righteous Abraham. He is the reason they are now God's chosen people. He alone is responsible for God's choice. You see, God's choice came about because of his love for Abraham and because he had made a solemn pledge with Abraham. God promised that he would bless Abraham and that through his seed, which was later Isaac, he would bring forth a people. His, he promised he would give this people a portion of land that would remain their possession forever. Yes, it was because of God's promise to Abraham that the Jews were chosen as God's special people. This will become clear as we go through our lesson today. To see the promise God made to Abraham, you must turn to Genesis chapter 17. To save time, we'll only read a portion of this chapter. But I trust that you'll go back and read the rest after the lesson. Genesis 17, 1 through 22. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the almighty God. Walk and live habitually before me and be perfect, blameless, wholehearted, complete. And I will make my covenant solemn pledge between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. In the next verses, we see the pledge God made to Abraham in return. God asked that Abraham walk before him in obedience to his commands, as it is written in verse 1. Abraham did walk in this manner before God. He was so obedient that he was known as God's friend. Remember what Jesus said? You are my friends if you keep on doing the things that I command you to do. Obedience made him God's friend. Because Abraham did not break this covenant with God, God was and is required to keep his end of the bargain. Abraham walked in obedience and trust before God all the days of his life. Now the Israelites did not keep covenant, but God's solemn pledge had been to Abraham, and Abraham did keep it. So God never had an opportunity to get out of the covenant. Verse 3, Then Abraham fell on his face, and God said to him, Now look at this verse carefully. Verse 4, As for me, behold my covenant, my solemn pledge is with you, and you shall be the father of many nations. So God's promise was to Abraham alone. Verse 5, Nor shall your name any longer be Abram, hi father, but your name shall be Abraham, father of a multitude, for I have made you the father of many nations, and I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you, and I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting solemn pledge to be a God to you and to your posterity after you. So God's covenant was with Abraham alone, however. He says in verse 7 that he will establish his covenant between Abraham and his descendants. This word establish in the Hebrew means to accomplish, perform, make to stand. Did you see in verse 7 that this was an everlasting promise? God promised Abraham that he would not only be a God to Abraham, but also to his descendants, the Jews forever. This is why the Jew was chosen. This is when the Jew was chosen. And this is why God has put up with their wickedness for all these years. It's all because God made a promise to Abraham. In verse 8, God says, And I will give to you and to your posterity after you the land in which you are a stranger, going from place to place all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So you see, because Abram found favor with God, God made him a promise for the future. Furthermore, it was because of God's promise to Abraham that the Jews were even given a special portion of land that would remain theirs forever, as you just read. God promised that this land would never be taken away and given to another nation. It would be an everlasting possession to Abraham's descendants. 
The land that God promised Abraham he would give to his descendants was itself very special to God. So special that God says in Deuteronomy 11, 10 through 12, For the land which you go in to possess is not like the land of Egypt from which you came out, where you sowed your seed and watered it with your foot laboriously as a garden of vegetables. But the land which you enter to possess is a land of hills and valleys and drinks water of the rain of the heavens, a land for which the Lord your God cares. The eyes of the Lord your God are always upon it from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. And now back to Genesis chapter 17. In verses 10 through 14, we see where God tells Abraham to circumcise all males. This ritual of circumcision would be the reminder of this great promise, this covenant that God had made with Abraham concerning them and their land throughout the generations. Verse 10. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your posterity after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised, and you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin. And it shall be a token or sign of the covenant, the promise or pledge between me and you. So the circumcision was simply an external observance to remind them of God's covenant with Abraham. God would never forget his promise. But since men often do forget, when things got rough and persecution came and others stole their land, they would be able to see the male babies being circumcised. Also, they would look at the circumcision of their own flesh and remember God's promise. For instance, when Rome conquered and temporarily occupied Israel, every time the Jews witnessed the circumcision being performed, they were reminded that God was their God, who had given them that land, and someday their land would be returned to them. Verse 12. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money, from any foreigner, not of your offspring. He that is born in your house and he that is bought with your money must be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the male who is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. God goes on to show Abraham how he will bring about his promise in verse 15. And God said to Abraham, As for Sarai your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah, princess her name shall be. And I will bless her and give you a son also of her. Yes, I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart. Now notice, he said in his heart. He didn't say with his mouth, but God still heard him, didn't he? Let's begin verse 17 again. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a son? And he said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. But God said, Sarah, your wife shall bear you a son indeed. And you shall call his name Isaac. Laughter. Notice God's next words. And I will establish my covenant or solemn pledge with him for an everlasting covenant and with his posterity after him. God promised to establish his covenant with Abraham's descendants through the line of Isaac. But Ishmael, Abraham's eldest son, was not left out. As you know, Ishmael became the father of the Arab nations and was also blessed by God. Verse 20. And as for Ishmael, I have heard and heeded you. So those few words that Abraham spoke in verse 18, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you, were heard and answered by God. In verse 20, we see what God gave to Ishmael at Abraham's request. Verse 20. 
And as for Ishmael, I have heard and heeded you. Behold, I will bless him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall be the father of twelve princes and I will make him a great nation. So God promised that Ishmael would become a great nation, which he did. Nevertheless, God was very clear as to whom his solemn pledge, his covenant would be passed on to. For God said in verse 21, But my covenant, my promise and pledge, I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this season next year. And God stopped talking with him and went up from Abraham. Immediately, Abraham obeyed God and carried out God's instructions. Every male, including himself, was circumcised. The reminder of God's covenant was now in their flesh. We're told this in verses 23 through 27. Once God had made this solemn pledge, this covenant to Abraham, God was committed. He had to keep his word. You see, God does not break covenant. He does not go back on his word. God keeps his promises even to his own hurt, just as he told us to do in Psalms 15, where David was asking God, Lord, who will live with you forever? And one of the requirements that God gave in verse 4 in answer to David's question was, He who swears to his own hurt and does not change. It is because God is so righteous that we can always trust him to do what he has promised he would do, even if it means his own hurt. We can have complete faith in God's word for what God has said he will do, he will carry out to the full. As we continue to witness God's faithfulness, and as he restores to Israel every inch of land that he gave to her, we can greatly rejoice. We can allow our faith to increase knowing that our God is a God who keeps his promises. By returning the land of Israel to those whom he swore it would belong to forever, God is gaining the complete trust and confidence of the Gentiles also. Isn't this marvelous? How righteous God is! How wise are his ways! Let's see now how even the liberation of the Hebrew children from Egypt was a direct result of God's promise to Abraham. God came to the rescue in order to keep his promise to his friend Abraham. God was compelled to deliver them because of his obligation to Abraham, his servant. He couldn't break covenant. Let me give you the definition of the word covenant, taken from the American Heritage Dictionary, quote, a binding agreement, covenant, God's promise to man, as recorded in the Old and New Testaments, to promise by or enter into a covenant, to agree, convene, unquote. As you know, the Israelites had been in bondage in Egypt for generations. So why did God suddenly become concerned about their plight at this particular time in history? We'll take a few moments and answer this question. We are told that their cry ascended to God because of their bondage. Exodus 2 and 23. However, after a long time, nearly 40 years, the king of Egypt died. And the Israelites were sighing and groaning because of the bondage. They kept crying, and they cried because of slavery ascended to God. After 400 years, why did their prayers now have such power with God? We will find our answers in Genesis 15, verses 13, 14, and 16. God had told Abraham previously that his descendants would remain in Egypt as slaves for 400 years. God had to fulfill his word. Verse 13. And God said to Abram, Know positively that your descendants will be strangers dwelling as temporary residents in a land that is not theirs, Egypt, and will be slaves there. And they will be afflicted and oppressed for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on that nation whom they will serve. 
and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. In order for God to keep his word to Abraham, certain things had to take place. These people must be Abraham's descendants. They must be slaves in Egypt. And they must remain in bondage in Egypt for 400 years. In verse 16, God then goes on to promise Abraham that at a certain point in time, he would deliver them and they would come back to Canaan. Verse 16, And in the fourth generation, they shall come back here to Canaan again. This was now the fourth generation. Four hundred years had passed. The stage was set. Everything was ready. God's word had to this point been fulfilled to the letter. He was now ready to hear and answer his people's cries for assistance. Exodus 2, 23-25 However, after a long time, nearly 40 years, the king of Egypt died and the Israelites were sighing and groaning because of the bondage. They kept crying and their cry because of slavery ascended to God. In this next verse, you see why God heard and delivered them. Verse 24. And God heard their sighing and groaning and earnestly remembered his covenant with Abraham with Isaac and with Jacob. What did God remember? He remembered his covenant. The reason God heard and delivered the Israelites was because God had promised Abraham that through his seed, Isaac, he would do all those things which are written in his word pertaining to his promise. This was the reason he heard and delivered them. God had to get these people who were now his people to the land that he had told Abraham they would possess forever because at this time they were certainly not there, were they? Thus God became concerned and made haste to keep his promise because as you now know, he had to work within the time frame that he had previously laid out in his own word. Verse 25. God saw the Israelites and took knowledge of them and concerned himself about them, knowing all, understanding, remembering all. Now you know why God took special knowledge of Israel while she was in slavery. Now you know why God chose Israel. God did not deliver the Israelites because they were different or better than other people at that time. As you saw, they were mere slaves in Egypt. Hence, their deliverance rested solely upon God's promise to Abraham. Therefore, because of Abraham, he listened to the cries of Abraham's descendants as they groaned in despair in Egypt. For God had promised Abraham, as you saw in Genesis 17, 7, that he would be the God of his posterity after him. So now, because of his covenant with Abraham, God must get these people who cried to him for help out of bondage and back to the land of promise. So God's next step was to send Moses to the Israelites in Egypt to remind them of God's promise of deliverance. Moses carried God's message of deliverance to them as God had commanded. However, neither Pharaoh nor the Israelites believed it at first. The descendants of Abraham failed to listen and heed God's word because they were unable to see beyond their present circumstances. So Moses returned to God feeling dejected, disillusioned, and disappointed. But God could not and would not give up on them. He must keep his promise and establish his covenant with this generation of Isaac's seed. Genesis 17 and 19. But God said, Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son indeed. And you shall call his name Isaac, laughter, and I will establish my covenant or solemn pledge with him for an everlasting covenant and with his posterity after him. These were the people. This was the time. God sends Moses back to Egypt to help him carry out his solemn pledge. For the sake of Abraham.
God swears by himself that he will establish his covenant with the Hebrew slaves, the descendants of Abraham and Isaac. Exodus 6, 1 through 9. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For compelled by a strong hand, he will not only let them go, but he will drive them out of his land with a strong hand. And God said to Moses, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty El Shaddai. But by my name, the Lord, the redemptive name of God, I did not make myself known to them. I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their temporary residence, in which they were strangers. I have also heard the groaning of the Israelites, whom the Egyptians have enslaved, and I have earnestly remembered my covenant. Accordingly, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will free you from their bondage. And I will rescue you with an outstretched arm, with special and vigorous action, and by mighty acts of judgment. And I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a God. And you shall know that it is I, the Lord your God, who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will bring you into the land concerning which I lifted up my hand and swore that I would give it to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you for a heritage. I am the Lord. You have the pledge of my changeless omnipotence and faithfulness. Verse 9. Moses told this to the Israelites, but they refused to listen to Moses because of their impatience and anguish of spirit and because of their cruel bondage. God promises five actions he will take in order to keep his covenant with Abraham. Number one, he promises to bring them out of Egypt, as he told Abraham he would do in their fourth generation of slavery, which he did. Number two, he promises to free the Israelites from the Egyptians' bondage, which he did. Number three, He promised to rescue them with special and vigorous actions. Thus, the mighty acts of power and miraculous wonders God performed in Egypt fulfill this promise. Number four, God had promised Abraham and Isaac and Jacob that he would be the God of their descendants. God keeps his promise in verse seven. Number five, Last but not least, God promises to bring them again to the land of Canaan and give it to the Israelites for a heritage, which he also did. After all your years of searching, Christian, now you know the answers to these questions. And they will indeed become even clearer as we go through the rest of our lesson. Never again will you have to wonder why God chose the Jew. You now know. It was to keep his covenant with righteous Abraham. We will look now and see how God told Isaac that it was because of Abraham that he, God, would now bless him and establish his promise with him and his descendants. Genesis 26 and 24. And the Lord appeared to him, Isaac, the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham, your father. Fear not. For I am with you and will favor you with blessings and multiply your descendants for the sake of my servant Abraham. Did God say he would bless Isaac just because he was a Jew? (laughs) Did he say he would bless him because he was different or special? No. God said he would bless him and multiply his descendants for the sake of his servant Abraham. Because God loved their forefathers, beginning with Abraham, is the reason God chose the Jewish nation. Not because of anything they were or anything they did, but simply to keep covenant and to get the Israelites back to the land that he had promised to Abraham, the land that he had later promised to Isaac and Jacob, the land that they and their descendants after them would inherit for an everlasting possession. God loved Abraham. God rewarded Abraham 
And it was and is because of Abraham that the Jews were and are today God's chosen people. Because God loved Abraham, he chose his descendants through the line of Isaac and then Jacob. Deuteronomy 4, 37 through 40. These verses show us beyond a shadow of doubt why God chose the Jew. Listen carefully. And because he loved your fathers, he chose their descendants after them and brought you out with his own presence by his mighty power from Egypt. So why did God choose them and deliver them from Egypt? Why did God perform all his mighty works of power in Egypt when he delivered them? It was because he loved Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Let's read verse 37 again. And because he loved your fathers, he chose their descendants after them and brought you out with his own presence by his mighty power from Egypt, driving out nations from before you greater and mightier than yourself to bring you in, to give you their land for an inheritance as this day. No, recognize and understand therefore this day and turn your mind and heart to it that the Lord is God in the heavens above and upon the earth beneath. There is no other. Therefore you shall keep his statutes and his commandments, which I command you this day, that it may go well with you and your children after you, and that you may prolong your days in the land which the Lord your God gives you forever. Notice the word forever. The land which the Lord your God gives you forever. God chose the Jews and delivered them by his mighty power because he loved their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not only did he choose them because of Abraham, but he even loves them because of Abraham, as we will soon see. Now that you realize that the Jews are really no different than you are Gentile, now that you realize that they Two are just frail human beings. Now that you know, they were simply a people chosen by God because of Abraham. Doesn't this knowledge help you to have more compassion for them? Christian, don't you now empathize with the Jew? You see, because of Abraham, the Jews were chosen to serve God. Just as today, we Christians have been chosen to serve God through Jesus Christ. Jewish, Yeshua, Messiah. All one has to do to see the comparison between the Jews being called to serve God because of Abraham and the Christians being called to serve God through Jesus Christ is to remember the filth and the bondage of sin that God through Christ has delivered the Christians out of in order to give them a new life and make them his own compared to the bondage of Egypt from which God delivered the Jews. Now ask yourself, were the Christians any more worthy of God's choice than the Jews were? No, no, a thousand times no. Why are Christians so hard on the Jews for failing to live up to God's expectations when they themselves refuse to obey God's commands and continue to turn away from God's righteous path? Instead of criticizing the Jews, look at the church of Christ and see if she as a whole is obeying the word of God any better than they did. How many Christians obey God's commands? How many Christians carry out the instructions in God's word? If we Christians care so much about obeying God's word, then why haven't we been praying for and supporting Israel? Is the professing church of today fulfilling hair calling? Is the church consecrated? Is the church most holy and pure as she is called to be? Why, most people who call themselves Christians are so disobedient to God's word that they are an embarrassment to the Lord. They're not true Christians at all. Oh, yes, Christians love to tell of their great love for the Lord, don't they? But as we read in John fourteen twenty three through 24, Jesus said, those who love me obey my word. And those who do not love me do not obey my word. In 1 John 2, 3 through 4, we're told that those who know God keep his commands. But those who say they know him and do not keep his commands are liars. 
And what does God command? Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Will you obey? If you begin to obey, I guarantee you that you will come to love Israel and the Jews as I do.